So Gordon, thank you so much for being here now with me, You're with my welcome. my audience in Brazil. So this is Gordon Gayet, the guy, the founder of Evidence-Based Medicine. It's such an honor to have him here today with me. And he's going to tell us the story of how EBM started. So how was it, Gordon? How, how did it well, to say I'm the, to say I'm the founder of EBM is not quite right, in that um, at least the foundation of EBM was set up by a guy named Dave Sackett, okay. who was my mentor. Okay, now it later he set up the foundation, and I came up with the term EBM and helped to implement it. But he set the basis, and so the story of the start of EBM is really from my uh, interacting with Dave Sackett. And what happened, I was a regular medical resident doing medical residency the way it was done then, which was physiologic reasoning and experience. Uh, and experience Give me of examples years. of these two elements, physiologic reasoning and clinical experience. Okay, so I remember being told, give as much digoxin as is needed to control the heart rate. I don't know how many people I killed as a result of giving enough digoxin to make them put in the toxic where they get arrhythmias. But it was said, you've got to do it. Oh, here's another, here's another great one. Um, in atrial fibrillation, uh, lower the heart rate to 80 at rest and keep them under 100 at exercise. And we were did that uh, my, for my first 20 years in practice. Uh, at least that is what we did. Um, and that was just on the basis of physiologic reasoning. Then somebody had the smarts to do a randomized trial where they said, okay, resting heart rate can go to 110. Inconceivable at the, at the time. And I remember being getting together when the paper was published with my internal medicine colleagues, and we all said, man, when we found out that the uh, resting heart rate, uh, 100 is just fine, um, and the m much fewer medications, much fewer health care, much fewer hospitalization, everything else fine, and we've been... Less doing, side we've effects? Been much less side effects, and, the, um, uh, and we've been doing the whole thing wrong on the basis of physiologic reasoning for the previous 20 years. There, there's a, there are, the, the, the latter is particularly compelling example because there is one randomized trial which changed the whole thing, but we've been doing it all wrong. And so basically what happened is when the, um, uh, the world had changed, so what had happened is that uh, in my learning the clinical epidemiology with Dave Sackett, when I went on the wards, I found out, started to say, what is the basis of all this? And it was a, it was built on sand. It was, it, it was just a build on physiologic rationale and some experts saying what to do some long time ago and everybody doing it. Really quite, in, in retrospect, quite remarkable. And so uh, then the culture changed fast. And so the culture and the, the story I told was a good example of the culture change. Randomized trial comes out, the right randomized trial at the right time, and it instantaneously changes practice because people had now people had now got the message that um, uh, that if you found you were doing something just because somebody a long time ago said this was the right thing to do on physiologic rationale, that as soon as you saw evidence to the contrary, then you would change, and that was the big change in culture that EBM brought on. But that's also could be an issue like. If you cherry pick evidence, right? Could you oh, tell absolutely. us a little bit absolutely. about that? Absolutely. So that's a uh, that has a great point because the other um, the other one of the huge changes in culture with EBM was systematic reviews, and systematic reviews are now I think they are just generally accepted that every individual randomized trial, yes, but you need a systematic review of randomized trials. And one of the things, if you're talking about a culture change, which I've been, I found extraordinary and will be very pleased with, is uh, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, certainly, when I went to audiences all over the world, including the major institutions in North America, and I put up a forest plot on a slide, I had to say, okay, here's the, what the line in the middle means, and here's what the dots mean. And the, I can now go anywhere in the world 
in the clinician audience, I put up a forest plot, everybody, I don't have to explain it. And that's everybody, great. Like it's really a, so people have, and that just shows the huge impact of systematic reviews and that clinicians have been looking at them enough. They've, they've uh, looked at enough forest plots which are pretty intuitive that they now get that. So again, a, a gigantic culture change where now people don't remember what it was like before EBM. They don't, re the world was different and it's only people as old as I am who remember it. And Gordon, what about, so we have the pulled evidence, but what about the certainty we have on that evidence? How does that influence our decision at that site? Well, the, the, um, the, the um, one of my uh, EBM slides is that EBM, um, the fund, one of the fundamental principles of EBM predates EBM by uh, more than a couple of thousand years. And it's from the Analects of Confucius. And Confucius says to the student, you know what it is to know, to know when you know and know when you don't know, that is real knowledge. Perfect. Um, and that is what the other thing that, or one of the other things that EBM gives us is a distinction between when we know and when we don't know. And my example of, uh, I'll come back to that same example because I think it is a lovely one of how we changed our approach to rate control in atrial fibrillation. Um, people had the sense that the uh, evidence, we, we did it because um, strictly on the basis of physiologic rationale, very low quality evidence. And that's why when we had one randomized trial, it changed practice immediately because everybody really knew that the prior, the prior practice was based on low quality evidence or very low quality evidence. So that uh, left them open to making quick changes when higher quality evidence came along. That's great, Gordon. That's so great. And we, I mean, we, scientific community, medical community, we're very thankful for this movement, which brings better patient care. Thank you so much, and thank you for your time, too. A very pleasure. <laughs> thank you. Go!